Welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. This is Matt Lynch. I hope you're having a great month. In this episode, Drew Johnson is interviewing James Diamond about his book, Jewish Theology Unbound. Before we get on to the podcast episode, could I ask you, you know this is coming, go on over to iTunes or wherever you get this podcast and give a rating. It really does make a difference. When we've had people give ratings, you see a significant increase in uh, the number of listens. So there's some by, you know, some strange internet alchemy. Um, a correlation between ratings and people finding out about it. So help spread the love. It's one of the best ways that you can contribute. So thanks so much. Welcome, OnScript superfans. I'm here today with James A. Diamond, who is the Joseph and Wolf Leibovich Chair of Jewish Studies at the University of Waterloo. That's in Canada, otherwise pronounced Canada. Um, he's got several books on Jewish philosophy and thought. Uh, I'll just read off a couple of the titles here. Maimonides and the Hermeneutics of Concealment, Converts, Heretics, and Lepers, Maimonides and the Outsider, and Maimonides and the Shaping of the Jewish Canon. And you can see the trajectory here is in medieval uh, Jewish thought. But the book we're talking about today is a, actually a much more bold and grand claim book. It's called Jewish Theology Unbound with Oxford University Press from 2018. Welcome, Jim, to OnScript. It's a pleasure, Drew. Now, you and I go back about 10 years to these conference series in in Jerusalem, um, the philosophy of the Mishnah, the Talmud, and uh, the Hebrew Bible, and or uh, what you call the Bible. And uh, But I realize uh, after uh, knowing each other for this long and having conversations about what we thought about these things, I don't actually know how you came to become a scholar. Um, so I always find that people have very uh, windy roads they end up coming into scholarship, so I'm interested to hear yours. So I'll start in uh, April of 1956, uh, and then we'll weave all our way towards the modern period. <laughs> um, but I grew up in a, a Orthodox home, and my parents sent me to the uh, kind of parochial schools where I got a very solid Jewish education, went to rabbinical college, and then... Um, had a very solid grounding in rabbinic texts and uh, Hebrew texts. Uh, but then I, I eventually ended up in uh, university um, and started taking philosophy courses and was introduced actually to the philosophical world by one of the great philosophers of our time who taught at University of Toronto, uh, Emil Fackenheim. And... Um, Eventually, it's still a circuitous route. I kind of graduated, um, and then I went to law school because I have a Jewish mother. Uh, so, um, <laughs> but all the all the while, I, uh, I I really wanted to be an academic. But as my mother said, academic schmacademic, you can be an academic later. Uh, and I went to law school, and little did she know that I did become an academic after practicing law for a few years. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, what kind of yeah. law did you practice? Um, I practiced civil litigation for a number of years. Really? In New York City or in Toronto? In, no, in, in Toronto. Okay. And um, while I was practicing, I decided to still continue with um, graduate studies. So I kind of did that while I was practicing, um, worked my way and got a PhD in Jewish thought and philosophy, mainly medieval thought. Um, and then a uh, position came up uh, where I wouldn't really uh, have to move. A position luckily came up in the in the kind of in the general area. And um, even at the time, I thought this was a lost cause. Um, I didn't really apply. Word got back to me from people in the university that why don't you apply? Um, and I applied, and here I am 20 years later, um, and I've never looked back. So, 
Well, okay, so I'm glad I asked that question because I, I didn't realize that you were a former lawyer. I hope you count that as a former lawyer. Yeah, uh, don't, which, don't don't hold that against me. <laughs> well, it just completely <laughs> makes sense of how you act in a Q&A session during a conference. So <laughs> okay. it's, a, it's a litigation, right? Uh, but, <laughs> right. but seriously, do you, do you feel like uh, between uh, kind of a traditional um, Hebrew education and law school that that was formative for your broader scholarly thinking? Uh, absolutely. I mean... All these things were extremely, I, I think I, I'm very fortunate that I took that route because uh, if you if you see the book, I think the book is kind of um, kind of an amalgamation of all the skills that I've learned, the, the rabbinic training, the legal training, the philosophical training, um, which kind of put me, I think, into a unique uh, position to bring all these things together. And, and that's what really, one of the one of the motivations for writing this book was, um, was the opportunity to really, like I said, kind of just join all these talents or background, uh, things that go into my very being and, and bring them into uh, to a conversation with each other. Yeah. No, I think that's right, and it's. I think it's always been my reaction to hearing you uh, speak, whether at a conference or more generally, that you know academics have this very um, punctuated way of speech, speaking and thinking, and then Jim comes in and sweeps everybody's legs uh, <laughs> with this completely different idea, and and it's usually more interpenetrating and more thoughtful. Um, and so I, I know that I've appreciated a lot of that, um, the skills that you've kind of brought together in this book. It, it, it just, it reminds me, it's speaking to a jury. <laughs> well, and there's something to be said about, um, for lack of a better word, the salesmanship of the argument. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so for many of our Christian listeners who might not be uh, entirely familiar with the Jewish tradition, like me, you know, 10 years ago, I wasn't super familiar with Judaism or uh, the the legal or the educational traditions within Judaism. Why... Why are uh, Jewish scholars often, and even throughout history, why are they resistant to the first two words in your title, Jewish theology? So uh, he, here is, uh, you hit on one of the reasons I wrote the book as well, um, is that first and foremost, there's a kind of a caricature that um, resulted from a lot of Christian um, kind of perspective on Judaism as being just a, a religion of law. Um, and legalisms, and rather than the old kind of uh, opposition between spirit and law, and that it has no spirit. It's kind of dead legalisms. And uh, the truth is that um, many of my colleagues that I grew up with uh, in the Jewish community, and, uh, kind of people I went to rabbinic uh, seminary with, actually, in a way, buy into that as well. And you actually have some some major philosophers in the modern times, like this Yishayo Leibovich, an Israeli, great Israeli philosopher, that also considers um, Judaism to be a religion of obedience, uh, performance of commandments, with literally no theology, uh, which I've, I've always found quite strange. Um, that is, uh, there could be a commandment to believe in God, which itself is a conversation we could have. But one would think that you would have to have some kind of concept of who that God is. And then we get into theology, um, which is a reason I also was gravitated towards people like Maimonides uh, or Nachmanides, great, great Jewish thinkers who were doing theolo theology or philosophical theology. Um, granted with great knowledge of law as well, uh, but considered, I think, theology, philosophical theology of paramount importance. So, so, so that, I think, in a nutshell, is, is another reason. It's a kind of um, an argument against what I think is a caricature. Yeah. And not to like exacerbate an internal uh, dispute here uh, amongst modern Jews, but... Um, in, in a nutshell, is there something that you think is just fundamentally lost by conceiving of Judaism as just obeying and practicing law? I mean, even that that's a caricature, but there's something to the caricature. 
I, I, I think absolutely. I think, I think what's lost is a really a core, in my opinion. Um, that is, every time, again, one performs a commandment, there's, of course, a legal uh, principle involved or a legal formulation. But one would have to have some kind of idea of the commander and the commanded and what is the relationship between the two what's the nature of the commander um you know uh what those command the goal of those commandments the aims of those commandments and believe it or not some of those things were controversial for instance maimonides who uh, part of his project part of his philosophical project was to determine the rationale of commandments was itself a, was itself controversial but the rationale of commandments, the ultimate aim, is, is theology, is, is um, you know, um, how one y- performs those commandments in order to, um, to build a relationship um, or to further a relationship with, the- with, with God. Um, and, and, and so, uh, to me, it's the core and, and literally every conversation or every debate between rabbis on a point of law to me involves theology. Theology is always in the background. Yeah. It's interesting. I think this would be a jarring statement for most people that there might be a rationale to the law. And I assume what you mean by that is, if, or the implication there is, if there's a rationale to the law, then that means God must be reasoning with us through this law in some way, and not merely saying, "Here's here's where I want you to jump, and here's how high I want you to jump." And uh, but but thinking about the nature of jumping and why you would do it, and why God would ask you, and what kind exactly. of a God would ask you. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, fascinating. So. Um, having read a little bit of Jewish thought and philosophy myself, um, I can say not everybody engages the biblical text uh, to the degree that you do. I think that's something uh, not entirely new, unique to your work, but unique kind of in broader Jewish thought. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to see what you think the role of uh, the biblical literature is, and maybe I could just put put a real big caricature on the table in contrast to the mission of the Talmud, or do you see them in perfect concert, or uh, you know Benjamin Summer who just thinks that the biblical material is Talmud essentially? It's it's the same thing. So where, what do you see the difference or the role played there? Yeah, I uh, Ben, I have I have some disagreements with Benjamin Summer. I I, I think that to to look at the Bible purely as another form of Debates between schools, and in, in, in the case of the Bible, call them the P school and the D school, just like re- great rabbinic schools like Shammai and Hillel, two of the great uh, rabbinic schools in the first centuries of the Common Era. I think is 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 a bit going a bit too far. Uh, that is, I I look at the Bible as reflecting some core rev- revelation that isn't a, a debate between different schools, and that's a. Um, you know that that's uh, that's a different, I think, argument. But but I look at the Bible as a core revelation. Now, as a Jew, I think I always look at the Bible with some layering of rabbinic texts. Um, for me, and what what was important for me in the book was to take that rabbinic layer, that rabbinic lens, uh, which often might be fanciful or um, to untrained eyes might seem flying way off the text, um, and rather to look at, at some of those um, as actually reflecting something that was going on in the text. Um, and, and, and so for me, they, are, they, they both go together. I, I can't look at the Bible separately, totally separately, from the way I look at it um, in, in, in light of my rabbinic training. Yeah. I think, I think Christians in only their kind of most naive form think that they can. <laughs> but I, I think most people will admit, no, I actually come through a pretty thick tradition uh, with particular habituated experiences within a church or a Christian community. And certainly, you know, post-Protestant, Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox, uh, Eastern Orthodox, all are reacting to the Protestant Reformation in some way and reading the text uh, in, according to the, in accordance to those reactions. 
Um, I wonder, though, if you could give an explanation, because I think a lot of people won't be familiar when you say that flying off, these kind of perpendicular stories. So could you give an example to let people know what kinds of stories and connections that are being made by uh, later later sages that that seem ridiculous, maybe, but what what you're doing with what seems to be out of out of uh, out of the box readings of the text. So let let me uh, give you one of the early examples that I that I use in um, in introducing my book, um, and is one of the reasons why I call the book Unbound. And there's a theme of freedom that runs through the book, um, rather than what. Christian tradition, and I think even philosophers like uh, Hegel and Kant caricaturize Judaism as kind of slavish obedience that doesn't allow any freedom. And that was another thing I was I was going against. So there is a famous um, argument in the Talmud between two schools uh, where they're arguing about some arcane point of law. Uh, one school actually calls on miracles to prove his point. And these miracles actually happen <laughs> to confirm his point. The other side says, too bad, we don't really listen to these miracles, and we don't listen literally to the voice of God. Because the voice of God actually came out and confirmed the opinion of that of the school that called on the miracles. That school actually cites God's word as written in the Bible, a verse that says, it is not in heaven. Now that verse... Is that the, from Deuteronomy 30? The, from Deuteronomy 30. Yeah, it's not 30. far from you. It's very near to you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. That verse is taken totally out of its context because in its context, it's actually referring to a specific, kind of a specific command of repenting. It says, repent, return to God. And then it says, this is not too difficult for you. Meaning it's not in heaven is a, is a uh, metaphor for something being not that difficult. One can achieve it. They take it out of context, out of its original context, and use it as a principle that one can no longer cite God or God's voice, literally, to support an argument or to support a debate. So that's, a, that's an example, I suppose, of a midrashic, what we call midrash, um, way of reading a verse. Um, if I can cite another example, just to make it a little, maybe a little bit more clear, because these things get, get kind of complicated. Um, I, I should point out as, as well that Christians will hear that, and they'll just say, that is just morally wrong. You just shouldn't do that, Right. Um, so, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm the worst, the worst version of the reaction is like, that is so wrong. Nobody should ever, I mean, we teach in hermeneutics, don't do that. So I, uh, we also need to tie together why somebody would do that. At some point. So, um, oh, you know what? Let me, let me, that comes to mind another Midrashic reading. And this, this is, uh, if I maybe explain the word Midrash, which is what I'm doing now, which is what the rabbis do, which is the kind of these these readings that appear strange to ears, let's say Christian ears or, um, or Bible scholars ears. Um, and that is this very point. So you can read the revelation of Sinai described as a great resounding voice um, that is no more. Right? Uh, those are the words in, um, in Exodus. The rabbis read that, and it actually can be read by looking at the word for no more as a voice that never ceased. It's a word in the Hebrew that can actually be played with. Uh, yasaf, kol, kol gadol velo yasaf, um, which is normally read as no more. So, so by the rabbis reading it as a voice that never ceased, they're actually layering it with two meanings. It is a voice for the rabbis that ceased, but it's also a voice that never ceases. So it's a voice that ceased, meaning directly coming from God, but it's a voice that never ceases in terms of those who are trained 
to hear the voice through the text. And so um, I think the rabbis would respond by saying, well, you guys don't really know how to read the text because you're not open to the voice of God, which is infinite. And so the voice of God, which is infinite, means that this is a text of infinite meanings, albeit one has to be trained in how to read it. <laughs> so there's another Midrashic reading. And, and uh, my book has kind of got a number of these. Um, we can maybe uh, uh, encounter some of these as, as we're talking, but hopefully that kind of gives a little bit of yeah. a taste. No, I think that's right. And so, and, and to tie this with the, the question I was going to ask next anyway, was um, the title is Jewish Theology Unbound. And Unbound, there's the strong theme of freedom, but not freedom from, as Americans can often think of, I'm free from all of these obligations, but almost like a freedom from and participation in Unbound. So um, why is that so central to the work that you're proposing here? So uh, it, it, it's central to me because, it, it precisely because of this idea we've been pursuing. That is, let's go back to this idea about uh, it is not in heaven. Um, what, in the rabbinic tradition, uh, one, of the, one of the great, um, I think, virtues for me of that tradition is this freedom of interpretation. That is, God spoke. Uh, we have the text of that speech. It's up to you guys now. You can screw it up <laughs> or you can interpret it in light of its general spirit. And so I believe there's a general spirit as opposed to what people just call just law and legalisms. And, and the early rabbis set out to interpret this book in the general, in the, in, in what they saw as a general spirit. Um, and it is in the spirit of freedom. That is, you guys are human beings. I'm God. I spoke. Now you have a sensitivity or you have a greater sensitivity to human beings than perhaps I do, which is perhaps another strange concept. But I leave it to human beings to figure out what I said in whatever circumstance comes out that's not clearly addressed in the text because of your sensitivity to human beings. Um, and so, so that's at the core, one of, one of the things at the core of my book, that is this, this freedom to interpret that's constrained by an understanding of what the overall text and voice of God is aiming at. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things I really appreciated about uh, the book, especially in the opening chapters, is, is you actually make an exegetical, what we call an exegetical case, that um, that actually is what is being advocated, even from C the Cain story forward, is this uh, this idea of reflection and discovery. Um, that there, there are ideas, but that they have to be reflected on. That, um, the phrase you use is, uh, there's two phrases that stood out to me. One was that there are these uh, philosophically empowering moments in the text. Um, and then uh, when you're talking about Cain and his lack of reflection that was being criticized there, um, the ethical gravity of avoiding reflection is how you refer to this. And so I don't think, and I, I would actually push it back even to Genesis 2, uh, the, the discovery of the woman is a process that somebody has to go through in order to find it with participating with God in that process in order to see. And so I think for you and me, we see philosophy all over the text. Uh, that this, uh, How do you define philosophy? I guess I thought yours was helpful, but, um, and I guess how... As a professional philosopher, you, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of other views of philosophy, and the one that I get all the time is, well, it's not really doing what the Greeks do, so it's therefore it's not philosophy. Right. So, I've, you know, it, clearly the, 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 the Bible is not, um, it's not even what Christians would call systematic theology. It's not a, it's not a philosophical treatise in the sense of working out uh you know, arguments, logical arguments, uh, aiming at some goal. Uh, but it is, it is cl in a way close to the Greek tradition. I mean, you know, the Greeks, uh, you know, so you read Socrates, uh, you know, Plato, they, they are in kind of narrative settings. They are discussions, um, which I think, you know, the Bible blazed the trail for this kind of thing, for philosophy to be conducted within a narrative. 
Um, and so going back to the, the, the narratives that you mentioned, for instance, the narrative of Cain, um, you know, I see the first conversation between a God and human beings is opened up with a question. That is, that is God addresses Adam and he says, where are you? That to me is a philosophical moment. It may be a philosophical moment that's squandered by Adam in, as you said, the same as Cain, by not listening to the philosophical import of the question and hiding, evading, right, which is what he does. Um, and so I see that as, as maybe one of the earliest and most powerful philosophical moments in history. Yeah. Um, where where the, God is... It, it, God is uh, offering a moment for somebody to join in a conversation and actually think about the nature of what's going on here. That's right. But it's shut and, down and, by fear, anxiety, something else. Right, right. And, ev and evasion, right? Evasion, I mean, yeah. Adam, Adam basically evades the question. Um, and if I can, just here's, here's another opportunity to, to show uh, Midrashic uh, interpretation at play. This, this word, um, where are you, um, the rabbis look at that word, and the word spelled the same way is the very first Hebrew word that commences the Book of Lamentations. And they kind of draw this connection between the two. Um, in Hebrew, it's Echa in Lamentations, um, which, which means basically uh, how, how can this have happened? Um, and then addressing the destruction the, the, the terrible consequences, the devastating consequences of destruction. And they, they read that back into this word, Ayeka, where are you? So this is what I mean by Midrash. This is, may sound like a very far-fetched connection, but I think the rabbis are actually digging very deep into the sense of this moment. Because what Adam has done in his disobedience is to rupture somehow the relationship between human beings and God. The first word in Lamentations is to explore the, the real, the consequences of a material physical rupture between the world and God, which is the destruction of the temple, which was considered in kind of the rabbinic tradition as the axis mundi or the, the, the bridge between God and the world. And so to... To, to read that back into this word, where are you, is to read God's um, question as layered with what Adam has just done. That is, what you've just done is this philosophical moment that requires you to address the question, where are you in this rupture that you've... Um, that you've kind of instigated or initiated between God and the world, right? So that, that's that's a little, a kind of another example of where I use kind of the rabbinic tradition, but where I also think they've they've somehow picked up on the moment, right? on the spirit of the moment. So I think for, uh, for those who are uninitiated to uh, Midrash or, or Talmud more generally, um, the advice here would be don't, don't be too flippant about things that don't look right to you, right? Uh, maybe, maybe sit and think that they that uh, they've read all of these texts very closely, and that they might be seeing something that you're not. Um, yeah. So I, I wasn't planning on asking this, but it seems uh, appropriate. You know, we do have this problem in the Christian tradition where we have theology and even systematic theology, and now analytic theology, um, where people really are not engaging the text in the Hebrew. Um, and I wonder, you've seen some of this unfolding in the last decade of the analytic theology kind of coming out. Um, like, what, What's your take on, I mean, what, what's your advice to, if you're sitting next to a systematic theologian who's trying to develop ideas about the ontology of God, um, but, but is not reading the Hebrew Bible? Uh, what would be your advice? So this is a this is a like a real uh, loaded question, Drew, it is. And, it, and it's something <laughs> you know. So I, I I teach these courses. I'm teaching one right now uh, to my students, most of whom uh, most of them do not know any Hebrew, 
Um, and one of the things I hammer away uh, throughout the course is this problem that you just uh, identified. The problem of, uh, you know, which I kind of disappoint them in a way that you guys will never, never really <laughs> understand this text completely. I will try my best um, because it's written in Hebrew uh, or the original is in Hebrew. So, um, so let's take, for instance, um, one of the things I, I always point out examples throughout the course uh, when trying to read narratives, uh, read laws. Uh, in translation. One of the things I do is to ask them, I don't have any required translation. I actually find it much, much more useful for all the students to bring in any translation they want. And then usually what that does is to highlight a problem. And you'll have uh, a verse, and then and then you'll have six different translations. And then I'll ask them, well, guys, what, what does this mean? Because they, it, it, you know, they think a translation is what the text says. It's obviously translation and interpretation. But when you get it, what you asked is uh, the philosophical connotations, the, the problems of ontology, um, especially with, with coming to God. So there is a chapter in my book where I deal with that famous, I am who I am, right? Um, which already, which, which is probably the verse in Exodus 3, that has attracted more interpretation that I would say that I think you would agree, Drew, than any other verse in the Bible. Um, As a Jewish scholar, are you kind of like obligated to, to – do you cut your teeth on that passage? And uh, it almost seems like whatever you say about Ehyeh Sher Ehyeh is almost determinative for your entire theological project if you're going to do Jewish theology. So honestly – for me, it became a core, um, a, a core issue, a core verse. Uh, the book, of course, spends a lot of time on it. People like Maimonides, especially the medieval kind of philosophers, uh, Jewish philosophers, just as Christian um, um, rationalist philosophers, if you want to call that tradition, like Aquinas, spent time on that. Uh, to the point where I think I, I quote one one of the scholars saying that uh, he's he's. There's so much scholarship on this that it's become a separate discipline of hayaology, right? <laughs> um, but but when you, well, when you say ask, that again slowly, haya, sorry, hayaology, yeah. haya the verb, being being the yeah. the root, uh, just for those, hovet, yeah, the re root of being, yeah, right, uh, upon which the, uh, the the name of God is is based, right, right. Okay. right. So, um, but I have to say. It's important for me, I think important for you, important for medieval rationalists. It probably did not occupy the central position that we're giving it for the rabbis. In fact, the, the, the verses that you read to a Jewish child, the very first verses are not that. It's God, uh, it's in Deuteronomy, right? Torah, Siva, Lanu, Moshe. God um, uh, commanded, uh, Moses commanded us the Torah, right, that God gave him, Morasha uh, Kihilat Yaakov. It is a legacy for all time for the community of Jacob. That's the first verse. <laughs> and perhaps that becomes the most important verse, right? The verse that establishes a relationship between Moses and God, between Moses and the Torah, and between the Torah and his people. Um, and then the second verse, also from Deuteronomy, is Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is, and of course we get into problems here again of ontology. Is the Lord one? Or is the Lord unique? Right? Uh, so one, unique, the very simple verse that God is one or God unique. The seemingly simple verse of I am who I am. Again, it could be different than I will be who I will be, which grammatically. Yeah, it's a, it's a grammatically ambiguous statement, right? So. Right, but perhaps more prone to I will be who I will be. That very simple gram tense change. Uh, I am who I am becomes the cornerstone of all ontology, theological ontology of God. Whereas I will be who I will be. 
uh, delivers an entirely different entente. So there's an example of, I think, going back to your, sorry to be being long-winded, Drew. No, it's lovely. You know me, right? <laughs> I'm a lawyer, I'm a Jew, you know, I can't stop talking. <laughs> you said it, I didn't. Uh, uh, right. <laughs> and so, um, so, so going back to this issue of, of Hebrew, um, I, I, I think to, to, to um, extract philosophy, philosophical theology, ontology from the Bible, one would have to be attuned to its Hebrew original. Amen. The amen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so speaking of being attuned to the Hebrew there, uh, I'm thinking of, uh, there's, there's too much good stuff in there for us to cover. So let me pick a highlight. Um, one that was actually a little perplexing to me at points, um, but your angelic encounters as metaphysics, right? So you, you, I was thinking, okay, he's going to tackle metaphysics here. And then I read that chapter and I thought, wait, this is just epistemology. Um, because you key in on this phrase, uh, the, the lifting up of one's eyes, right? This idea of lifting up of one's eyes. So explain why that phrase, uh, in a chapter on metaphysics, why that phrase played so prominently for you in its, all its variegated uh, appearances in the Hebrew Bible. Okay, so... Uh... Yeah, this, this I'm not is, arguing wasn't... with your chapter, by the way. I'm, I'm, I just thought it was no, a no. fascinating no, example. No. no, I appreciate, I appreciate the, um, the question. And it's interesting that that, sh that you point out that chapter because I have a friend who's not philosophically trained and not biblically trained also, and he's slogging his way through the book. Uh, and he finds, he was like talking to me about it. And then he said, I found that chapter, <laughs> um, a struggle, yeah. a struggle. I guess because there I got, like you said, perhaps into metaphysics, meta, maybe epistemology. Um, but let, let me try and let me try and answer your question with with uh, one of the narratives that I deal with, um, which is, and so the 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 chapter deals with angelic encounters, um, and one of them, which I think is a is a kind of a, if one were to call it a core encounter with angels, it would be the one with Jacob. Uh, before he's about to meet his brother Esau uh, at the river Jabbok or... <laughs> Yabok. Yabok, okay. So I don't know how the audience... Yeah, you can say things it, in but... Hebrew, they'll figure it out. Okay. <laughs> they'll transliterate in their heads. <laughs> okay. So so um, w one of the things that, um, that I mentioned there is this angelic encounter... Uh, somehow uh, is a kind, one could take it as an allegory, one could take it as really happening in, in whatever way Maimonides takes it as, as, a, as a dream, um, uh, that Jacob is left with a heightened consciousness um, as a result of this encounter, which leads to his encounter with another human being. And that changes, this angelic encounter changes the way he looks at the world changes the way he understands the world, perhaps an epistemological uh, transformation, um, but also changes the way he encounters other human beings. And so the way he encountered Esau before, um, in my reading, and his own father, was kind of people as opportunities for advancement. <laughs> um, his name, after all, is based on the root for deception, um, which again, one people who don't know Hebrew or don't read the text in the original kind of miss out on that, that significance, that maybe wordplay, the, uh, the etymology of the name. And, and notice his name is transformed um, as a result of his encounter. But what, what it does is he struggles with an angel um, he kind of wins this struggle, but, but he's forced to let the angel go. He's damaged at the end of that struggle. Uh, and so what I take that to be is this angelic encounter opens up his eyes to the idea of when you encounter the other, it requires sacrifice on your part. Every encounter, every authentic enc encounter requires you to minimize yourself, to allow space for the other. And so in very graphic terms, the, the injury that he has as a result of this 
is this kind of uh, teaching moment or this heightened awareness that I can no longer encounter the other authentically simply by using him, by exploiting him, by seeing him as an opportunity. But it's it's an opportunity for me to somehow allow space for that other. And in that encounter, that that forces me to minimize myself, which I see um, reflected in the injury. And so that informs the whole encounter after. The whole encounter with Esau afterwards is a, is a new way of encountering his brother, which opens up relationship, which he doesn't have, which he didn't have before. And, and I, I hope that that responded to the question in some way. Uh, no. Well, and I, I think what's, what's remarkable and what I, I really appreciate it is um, there's this interplay. Be- Again, when you're reading in the Hebrew, there's, there's phrases and terms and, and actually pairings of verbs that you picked up on that uh, I've also written on before. I was like, okay, I'm not crazy. Jim saw this as well. Um, but uh, that, that prompt questions of reflection that prompt the theological journey rather than I think what sometimes Christians in, their, in, the, in the worst versions are trained to do is I've got theological ideas. Now let me go to the text and see how those you know, turn out. <clears throat> and sometimes try to domesticate the text to the idea. Um, and so I think this really bottom-up approach that you're, I mean, it's not entirely bottom-up. You're always coming through your tradition and, and notions that we've learned. But there's just a sensitivity here that um, seems extraordinary uh, to the work. I think that's important, Drew, if I can just uh, for a moment. Uh, I try to, to, to even when I'm re- resorting to the rabbinic tradition, I try to really uh, root it in the text. I think I hope you you notice that, uh, like you say, uh, there's a literary sensitivity there. I think uh, not just a philo- not just kind of flying off and trying to uh, find philosophy in the text where it's not there. I actually read the text very pretty closely, um, and and see the text saying these things um, that you mention. Uh, so I, I you know I, I think that's important for those. You know your audience. I, th- I think they're going to find not not fanciful interpretations. I think I think I try to very often, not very often, always to anchor these interpretations in, like you said, uh, context, wording. Very, uh, you know, I, I think a close sensitivity to the words that are used. Uh, so, yeah, and I think that's one reason for for Christians who maybe don't have access uh, to the Hebrew. Uh, with facility at least, it's one of those areas where we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can listen to our uh, Jewish brothers and sisters who can help us think through these things, right? Um, so uh, what, uh, at the end of the book, you you bring in um, the Hashoah, the, what is sometimes called the hol- Holocaust, but um, for North American Christians, it struck me when reading this, you know, the, the or, and even many European Christians, we don't have, uh, thank God, we don't have a massive, singular, unifying historical event that shapes all of our theology uh, the way Judaism does today. So I guess uh, for you, how did Hashoah, uh, why is it necessary? Because a a lot of Christians aren't going to be able to relate to this, but why is it necessary that when you're doing theology Jewishly, uh, you're always having to think over the shoulder of Hashoah, or I I don't know what the metaphor is, but it seems like it's ever-present. Right. So uh, it, I think I think any I think I, I mentioned it in the book, um, and I actually when I was writing the book um, and and thinking about how to conclude it, I was thinking for for a very short moment to stay away from that topic from the Holocaust, but I realized that you know after 1945, no theology, no Jewish theology can be conducted without addressing. Um, after all, theology is literally talking about God. Um, you know, where was God um, at a time when uh, a large majority of Jews in Eastern Europe were killed, um, of, uh, of vast numbers that were Orthodox as well, besides uh, secular. Uh, so, th- so that this event... For me, in terms of the destruction, the consequence of destruction, far overshadowed the destruction that became the paradigm for all theological rabbinic talk that addressed suffering 
and destruction. And that was the temple. So the, the rabbis spent a lot of time. And in fact, one could look at the entire rabbinic tradition with all its legalisms and all its debates as in itself a response to the destruction of the temple. Right? What are we going to do now? You know, uh, we have no center of gravity for the cult. We no longer have a place to bring sacrifices, which take up a lot of time in the Bible. Um, the conversations about uh, law themselves are ways of filling that void. How can we now, when two-thirds of Eastern European Jewry, all, um, all Jewish institutions, an entire culture was destroyed, a language was destroyed... It's it's impossible to talk about Jewish theology which, uh, without addressing that. Now the question is, will you ever come to any answers? Uh, perhaps that's not what it's about. And I think it, you've noticed in my chapters, I don't really resolve anything, but I think the very the very nature of addressing this and conducting some kind of dialogue with your tradition, with in my case the rabbinic tradition. Um, and in the Christian tradition, I mean, this is suffering on a massive scale, human suffering. Forget about Jewish suffering. Um, you know, how does one account for this? And, and uh, you know, then maybe extrapolate to other genocide suffering that, that is happening as we speak. Um, so so it, it's to me, it's, it's just impossible for any theology to be, com- to be complete or to be... To be conducted without addressing that. And let me, let me, if I could just add a personal note uh, for me as well. I mean, my parents uh, uh, went through this, they were survivors and virtually everyone I grew up with um, as a child, um, because my, my parents sent me to, as I said in the beginning, to, to uh, kind of Jewish day schools, uh, virtually everyone in my class um, had parents that, uh, that experienced the same um, same kind of suffering survivors. So it's just something that kind of in me was ingrained, uh, something that from a personal point of view, I can never escape. <laughs> I can never escape it virtually every day. Um, yeah. Um, and, well, I think and, it's important for, uh, you know, I, I think most of us think of the Holocaust as something, as, as a history lesson for us. Like, you know, the best that comes out of our discussions of it is never let something like that happen again. Um, but I, I think in many ways, in, you know, in what Deuteronomy is trying to accomplish, there's a living memory that a lot of people don't understand is still actively, formatively shaping uh, thought patterns about God, who he is, and his interactions with the world, which included, I, I, I think I have this correct, that some, some Jewish communities took it that this was God's sign that they need to walk away from God, right? Right, right. Um, um, and, and just one other, one other reason, I guess, in answer to your question, your original question about why, is both, you know, my, the rabbinic side of me forces me to do this, the personal side of me forces me to, to address this, and the philosophical side, of course, um, in my own experience, is the, 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 the scholar, the great philosopher who introduced me to the world of philosophy, himself became, in, in, my, in, my, to, in my opinion, one of the greatest philosoph- philosophical um, struggles with the meaning of the Holocaust, and that was Emil Fackenheim, um, who wrote, for the sake of your audience, if they want to, I guess, his, the, um, one of the seminal books is a book that he wrote called God's Presence in History. So my, the philosophical side uh, of my kind of background, also because I, because I was influenced very, very much by Emil Fackenheim, um, also forced me to address this issue. Yeah. So it's kind of all think, these dimensions that just... Well, and I think that's so important to remind audiences who are used to separating philosophy from history, right? So that philosophy is transcending history in some way. And I, actually, I had a quote that I wanted to read. I, there's, I have lots of quotes underlined here that I wanted to read, but I'll, I'll just read one. It's on page 58. You say, The Bible thus presents the Hebraic challenge to what stimulates philosophical investigation. Rather than in wonder... It begins in pain, despair, anxiety, and frustration that is so at odds with the ethical idea of humanity on the one hand and the metaphysical ideal of a benevolent, beneficent God on the other. 
And I think um, Drew, that, I couldn't have actually... said that better myself. <laughs> <laughs> and you did warn in the opening of the book that you weren't going to put these in a box and tie a bow around, right? Them, right? So these these are ongoing discussions. Very Talmudic in the sense that these are this is an ongoing discussion. Okay. Well, with that, I want to turn to a speed round where we're going <laughs> to ask some more lighthearted questions. Okay. Uh, are you ready? And uh, the goal is here to give short, I'm ready. witty answers. You know, so. I, I can I can do witty, but short, I'm not so sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, turn on your, your best Woody Allen okay. uh, um, part of your mind here. Okay. So are you willing to do a Henry Kissinger impersonation right now? <laughs> Uh, you know what, uh, Drew? Wait, I, are I, you doing it right now? <laughs> you know what, Drew? I'm, uh, I think maybe in another 30 years, maybe. Is that what yeah. you see when you see me? You see no, a, no, no. A hundred year old. <laughs> Look, if you start smoking two packs of Pall Malls a day, you might be able to do it in 30 years. Okay. Um, what's your favorite holiday and why? My favorite holiday is Purim, the uh, holiday when we read the Scroll of Esther because in line with my book, it's the day that when I was in rabbinic school, it's the day that they allowed us to let everything hang out, <laughs> right? Right. They kind you get of to dress just, up and right, act they, crazy, they right? Cross dress, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, switch around uh, evil, confuse evil with good. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Drink. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So okay, some people don't know what you're talking about oh, here. Okay. So Purim is kind of like. Halloween in some ways where kids get to dress up and do things out of out of normal course but then also there's this there's a, a I don't know if it's single tradition or multiple traditions where people just drink until you don't know good from evil right and so that, people... that's actually a rabbinic tradition a uh, rabbinic tradition that uh, uh, plays on one of the central motifs in the scroll of Esther which is everything got turned on its head right it's the Jews that actually ended up uh, being victorious over their enemies. Haman got strung up, the evil guy, rather than the good guy. So, so, so they they extend that <laughs> into life, right? Yep. Uh, a Why man not? can become a woman. I mean, not literally, but you know, yeah. you can cross. You can do all the things, which is interesting. A space when violation of the law becomes a kind of performance of the law. Which is interesting, not to take that yeah. to its ultimate there, conclusion. There is a series of movies uh, based on that. They're horror movies where all laws are lifted for 24 hours. I have not seen these movies. I've only heard about them. People go out and murder and do all kinds of horrible things. But that is not what's going on. Okay. For, yeah, just to be clear. Um, okay, next. Have you ever made a student cry? Uh, I have to say, yes. Um, <laughs> you don't You don't have to give details. We, you know, it's, it's uh, kind of a serious... But uh, if I can for a moment, I know I know it's a. I, I actually give a course on Holocaust and film, um, and I show um, a very short documentary, but maybe one of the earliest documentaries, a French one called Night and Fog, which I which is a very hard hitting documentary. And I know nowadays you're supposed to create safe spaces for students, uh, and say, you know, this might upset you, of course, I don't know who would take a course in the Holocaust and not expect <laughs> to be upset. I mean, that's the Fair point. point. The point Fair of point. the film is to upset you. And after the film, um, one of the students, this only happened once, which I wish it would happen more, was crying. And the reason, he, the reason he was crying, this is very interesting. He was sitting with his computer, of course, open to take notes ostensibly. And he's looking at students in front of him and he's seeing that some of these students are are doing other things on their computer while this documentary, and he's actually crying because he can't believe that this is going on while this, which which was really I found that quite incredible. The student was the way students were supposed to react. It was supposed to you know so sensitive. So I know I changed the light hearted question into it. No, but no, it was kind of a, a teaching a, moment. It was kind of a teaching I mean, moment, both for me yeah. and for my for my. Students. I am going to use that story. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's the epitome of distraction, right? Um, okay, well, so in in the vein of that story, uh, knock knock. Who's there? <laughs> Unsharpened pencil. Unsharpened pencil. Who? Never mind, it's pointless. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, knock, knock. Oh, who's there? Yodel. 
<laughs> yodel who? Yodel. You just yodel. Yodel who? Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. You see, my, my, my clients, they cry, but they never laugh. They never laugh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of wit I was looking for. Um, okay. So you're a philosopher, so I'm going to give you a philosophical puzzle. Are you familiar with John Rawls? You've heard of him before? Mm, a little bit. Yeah. When I went to and law they, school, his name was yeah, mentioned and the, a few and times. The, you know, the trolley problem, right? Uh, and ethics. Okay, so here's the Rawlsian trolley problem. So you're under the veil of ignorance. You are both the man who throws the switch and the man, the one man on the one track and the five people on the other track. What do you do under the veil of ignorance? Under the veil of ignorance. Um... <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I would, um, I would issue yes. a veiled threat. Ooh, nice. Against both. <laughs> Good comeback. Both I wasn't sure how you're going to handle that one. Okay. Um, what professional obligation do you dread most? Um, grading papers. Amen. <laughs> and uh, what do you enjoy? What do you enjoy most? Um, what I enjoy most is actually the, um, the 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 give and take between myself and serious students in my classes. I actually enjoy that the most. That's and the and, uh, serious and now is, uh... now a conver conversations with you, Drew. I oh. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. He's winking the whole time he's saying. No, that. it's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is this? Is a hard question. What is the best book in Jewish studies in the last fifty years? And you can't give any of your own books as an answer. Best back in um, best book in Jewish studies. Maybe even the most important one. You think? Um, can Can I give you the most important one for me? Sure. That changed my life, which yeah. is not on. I don't think it would be on most people's lists. When When I came out of rabbinic school, or when I was still in rabbinic school before I started philosophy in university, I was in Israel, and I went to first thing I did was get a library card. And I took out a book, which was a scholarly book on Joseph Caro, who was um, a medieval, probably one would say, if you asked Orthodox Jews, the greatest, maybe one of the greatest Jews that ever lived, because he left the code of law that became the authoritative court of law, court, code of law, called the Shulchan Aruch. And he left this, um, he operated, uh, lived in about the 15th century, 15th century in Israel. And then I took out this book and it was called Joseph Caro, Lawyer, Mystic, Doctor. And it was a scholarly biography, which is all scholarly, scholarly actually portrayed this as a real man, right? A real human being. Whereas before I thought this was the, the author of this code, you divorce him completely from, and then I realized he was a mystic. He actually had conversations with angels at night, which is not, right? He was a philosopher. He knew medicine. And so for me, that was a turning point in my life. That is, that behind these great works um, was, a, was an actual human being who experienced life in all kind of the various dimensions that one does, rather than just pegging him and putting him in a kind of cubby hole uh, as the author of this great code, right? Um, so that, I guess, for me, was I, the book. I, no, I, I had a similar experience with, um, it's a history of the Christian church, or history of Christian thought by Justo Gonzalez, but it was just this, these weren't just ideas, but they were actually people who debated these and worked these out. And, and they, you know, and again, we have some examples like Tertullian, who is a mystic who goes into these uh, Holy Spirit infused, you know, almost questionable <laughs> trances that he has later. Yeah. So it just. Uh, if I can, from a serious point of view, also yeah. uh, another that might be more accessible to the audience is uh, one that also kind of changed my life uh, was um, Abraham Joshua Heschel's uh, the, Sa the Sabbath. I think that after all my rabbinic training and all the stuff I read about the, the importance of the Sabbath, that kind of really changed not just my notion about the Sabbath, but the whole idea of holiness and time as well as holiness and space. So I would strongly recommend that to your audience. Um, yeah. You know. we, we had his daughter on, uh, on the oh, podcast yeah. Susanna. Uh, last year. Yeah, yeah Susanna. Uh, okay, what's, I have high expectations for this next question. What's your best one-liner joke? 
take my wife, please. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? <laughs> Your audience, see, I tried that on no. my on my students. They, yeah. had, they, were, they were just like... Uh, I remember hearing that as a kid. You know, this is like vaudevillian line, right? Um, and I just did not get... I didn't get the play on words. I was just like, what is it? Why are they laughing? Why is it even funny? And then so later... I tried that. After I got married. I spent, no, I'm just kidding. I spent my entire class yesterday explaining the joke. <laughs> <laughs> that probably made it hilarious. <laughs> okay. Final question. Um, what idea, uh, now we usually say in biblical studies, but you can kind of be, feel free to range whatever area of scholarship you think is important, but what idea do you wish would just go the way of the dodo bird, would just go away? It's not helpful anymore. You know, it's, it's hard to ask me as a teacher because I find every idea, even bad ideas, is helpful. Oh, yeah, that's so, true. You uh, need foils. Yeah, so, uh, you know... Um, what comes to mind is um, the idea that there is no theology in Judaism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's so go it's back to the beginning. Central, basic, <laughs> but much needed. Yeah. Well, Jim, thank you very much for spending this time with us and the audience of OnScript. The book, again, is Jewish Theology Unbound by Oxford University Press. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Drew. Likewise. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study slash donate.